Christ the hope of glory. Men of prayer are men life. of authority. Lift your right hand and shout out, my enemies are finished. Open your heart, receive from him. Christ is calling you, brother, receive your hope. Christ is calling you, sister, receive your life. Bridging Christ, the hope. We are discussing the subject of marriage and we are specifically looking at the excellent marriage, the excellent marriage. And in the previous episode, I did define what we mean by excellent as well as marriage. Just to recap, in case you missed that broadcast, um, I did mention that excellence is all about the quality of being outstanding, the quality of being outstanding or the quality of being extremely good, the quality of extremely good. Therefore, when we talk of an excellent marriage, we are really talking about a marriage that is satisfying, a marriage that is outstanding, a marriage that is extremely good. And there are three things about excellence that I did mention and which are very important. Number one, I did mention that God is excellent. So excellence is the nature of God. And so all of us must strive for excellence in whatever we do in life because to be excellent is actually to embrace the nature of God in our lives. And so God in his, in his excellence, uh, I say that he is excellent in power, judgment and justice. Job 37 and verse number 23. And I also mentioned the fact that his name actually is excellent. The name of the Lord is excellent. The Bible says that his name is excellent. Psalm number 8 and verse number 1. Psalm number 8 and verse number 1. But also in his excellence, God does excellent things. He does excellent things. Praise God. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse number five. And then we moved on to say that excellence is actually a spirit. Excellence is a spirit because in Daniel chapter six and verse number three, Daniel is said to have had an excellent spirit. The Bible says that he had an excellent spirit. We also uh, read that in Daniel chapter five and verse number 12. And I believe that we all need to embrace the spirit of excellence. We need a baptism of the spirit of excellence so that whatever we do is driven by that spirit, the spirit of excellence. And lastly, on, on, on the aspect of excellence, um, I did mention the fact that God's will for us is excellence in all aspects of our lives. God wants us to manifest excellence in all aspects of our lives. And so we must strive for excellence in all aspects of our lives, including our marital lives. Praise God. And then um, I also defined marriage. I said marriage is the union of two people or the coming together of two people of opposite sexes. The coming together of two people of opposite sexes in order to fulfill divine purpose, in order to fulfill divine purpose. In Genesis chapter two, verse number 24, the Bible says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one flesh. The joining together of a man and a woman to fulfill divine purpose, to fulfill divine purpose. Now, that's, simply means that marriage has a purpose. There are reasons why God brought marriage to existence. And 
there are some few reasons that I highlighted in the previous episode, for example, I did mention that marriage was established to address the challenge of loneliness. Because in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18, God says, It is not good for a man to be alone. I shall make for him a suitable helper. And so marriage serves the purpose of addressing the challenge of loneliness. And then secondly, I did mention that marriage provides a platform for companionship. And companionship goes deeper than just solving the issue of loneliness. We all need a close companion, somebody we can lay our minds bare to, somebody that we can share our deep secrets with, somebody that we can share our aspirations, our fears, our concerns with, and that is a close confidant. And marriage provides that platform where we can have a close companion in our spouse. Uh, thirdly, marriage is also there to provide a legitimate platform for satisfying sexual desires. Marriage provides a legitimate platform for satisfying our sexual desires. So sexual desires should not be satisfied anyhow, you see. Because, I mean, the Bible says that we must refrain from adultery, sexual immorality, and fornication. You see, sex outside of marriage is not permitted. And therefore, God put in place marriage so that those that are married can actually fulfill their sexual desires in an acceptable manner, in a way that is acceptable and pleasing before God. Now, hear this. Marriage also exists for procreation and the raising of godly children. So we are not just looking at procreation. We are also looking at marriage as a platform where when children are born, they can be raised by both the husband and the wife, by both the father and the mother together so that those children can grow up in a manner that is pleasing before God. And uh, lastly, I did mention that marriage was also established for the betterment of society. Because when people are properly raised within the family setting, then they become good citizens of the community. They become good citizens of nations. And so marriage exists also for the upliftment or betterment of nations and communities. Praise God. Now, I want us to take this discussion further in this broadcast because we are looking at the excellent marriage. Now, what I want to do in this discussion is to really look at what are the three foundational pillars of an excellent marriage. How is an excellent marriage formed? What are the pillars on which you can build an excellent marriage? And for us to look at that, I want us to read a portion of scripture from the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24, where the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, this is an important portion of scripture, because it gives us three foundational pillars of any marriage that is going to turn out to be excellent. And so the three foundational pillars of an excellent marriage, as I see them in this passage of scripture, Genesis 2 and verse number 24, are number one, the principle or the pillar of living. It says, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. The aspect of living. We need to look at what that means. And then number two is the principle of cleaving. After you have left, you must cleave. So, living must be followed by cleaving if a marriage is to turn out to be excellent. If the marriage is turned out to be extremely good and extremely outstanding. Praise God. And then the last aspect is the aspect of becoming one flesh. So, the aspect of oneness. So, the aspect of live, cleave, and become one. Live, cleave, 
and become one. And this is vitally key and vitally important. So let's look at these uh, three aspects very quickly. Number one, the Bible says that for this reason shall a man leave his parents. A man shall leave his father and his mother. What does this living aspect mean? Does this mean that if somebody enters into marriage, they should have nothing to do with their parents, disconnect themselves completely from their people? I don't think that is what the Bible is trying to drive out here. And so we need to have a proper understanding of what it really means to live. To live here, first of all, signifies the fact that when you enter into marriage, you need to know that you have entered a new entity. You are a separate, independent entity. And this new entity called your marriage must have its own value systems. It must have its own rules and regulations. You must not allow others to remote control your marriage or to dictate on what should happen in your marriage. There has to be complete living. And so there are several aspects of living that we can talk about. Number one, obviously you must live physically. It is not proper for someone to marry in their father's house. It is not proper. Then you are still a child. So if you reach a stage of getting a woman, like if you're a man, you are reaching a stage of getting somebody as your wife, then you must live physical, physically. You must leave your father's house to stay alone because this is an independent entity. So you can't continue living with your wife in your father's house. Then you're not married. You need to move out. You must leave. You must leave. You must find your own independent accommodation. And that is only one aspect of living. So we are talking about living physically. But there's also an as as aspect of living that has to do with living emotionally. You must live emotionally. There are so many people that are so attached to their people. Actually, they are more attached to their parents, their brothers and their sisters than they are attached to their spouse. And that brings a lot of problems. It creates a lot of problems, a lot of tension between married couples. That is why we are saying you must live emotionally. You see, your emotions must be directed toward your spouse. You must be more concerned about your spouse than anything else because the Bible says that you must leave your parents. But also this will mean that you must live in terms of value systems. In terms of value systems. You, you, can't, you can't afford to operate your marriage uh, based on other people's standards. Thank God for how your parents raised you. But you see, once you enter into marriage, you have to agree on specific value systems of your marriage. Of course, your value systems must be centered on the Word of God, must be based on the Word of God, must be informed by your knowledge of what God wants and expects of you. And that is very important. And so we are talking about living, living physically, living emotionally, but also living financially. Living financially, you can't marry someone, you can't enter into marriage hoping that somebody is going to finance your marriage. Not, not at all. That is not right and it is not condoned. It should not be encouraged. You need to understand that once you enter into marriage, you must have your own sources of income. That is why it is very important even for those of us that are you know, not yet married, and, but we are looking forward to getting married one of these days, you need to work on your financial life. You need to create, you know, stable sources of income. You need to have well-defined sources of income. If you enter into marriage, how are you going to finance your marriage? How are you going to, you know, finance your activities in the marriage? How are you going to finance all those requirements and needs, you know, that have to be in place in your marriage? You need to have clearly and well-defined stable sources of income. You must live financially. Don't enter into marriage hoping that because probably your parents are well-to-do, they are rich, and so my parents are going to bankroll my marriage. That is not right. Now, hear this. Whoever finances your marriage is the one who is going to control your marriage because they will dictate 
on when to have children and not to have children because you are running on their budget. So they have to control your aspirations. They have to control your plans. They have to control whatever you want to do. All your projects have to be controlled because they are the ones financing your marriage. So there are so many people that have entered into marriage without adhering to the principle of living. They are still so attached. You know, their umbilical cord is still so well connected to their uncles, their brothers, their sisters, and, and their parents, and so on and so forth, such that the spouse find, finds it very uncomfortable to interact with them. And so that is not right. And I am saying to you that if you want excellence in your marriage, you must live. God says here, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. You see, you must live. The question is, if you are married, did you leave your father? Did you leave your mother? Why are you still holding on to certain practices and values of your father's house that are not helping you in your marriage? That are not helping. They are bringing a lot of stress because you are comparing your spouse with your parents. You are comparing your wife with your mother. You are comparing your husband with your father. Listen to me. Your wife is not your mother and your husband is not your father. This is an independent entity that must have its own value systems. You can't afford to just import things from elsewhere into your marriage without proper discussion as to what you, you believe is going to work for you in this marriage. And so it is very important that you practice the principle of living. God says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. Praise the name of Jesus. So we'll continue with this discussion uh, after this short break. God bless you. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the Welcome back. We are discussing the three foundational pillars of an excellent marriage taken from Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24. Now let's move on to look at the second aspect of this. Because God says, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Now this aspect of cleaving is very, very important. To cleave simply means to join together. To cleave also means to stick together. It also means to be glued together. Now it signifies permanence of arrangement. And so if the Bible says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, he's talking about the permanence of marriage. That marriage is not a temporary arrangement. It is not something that you get into uh, hoping that after five, six years you opt out. Not at all. This is a permanent relationship. It is a permanent affair. Now, it signifies continuity. That the moment you enter into marriage, you must understand that you are there to stay. You are there to stay separation, divorce, and all those things are not permitted. Actually, the Bible says that God has divorce. Now, so you need to understand this, that this aspect of cleaving to your spouse is very foundational in helping you achieve or attain an excellent marriage. You must cleave. You must be glued together. Now, this signifies singleness of purpose. You see, do you have singleness of purpose in your marriage? Are you running? Are you pursuing the same purpose as a couple? Because that is very important. Cleaving here will mean that you must embrace your spouse. You must accept your spouse as God-given. There are so many people that are in marriage, but they have never come to the place of accepting and embracing their spouse as a gift from the Lord. So you need to understand that that your spouse is a gift from God and therefore you need to embrace him, embrace her as such. Embrace 
your spouse as a gift from the Almighty God. You must accept your spouse. Accept your spouse as a special gift to you. And therefore, your spouse should have a special place in your life, a special place in your heart. And your spouse must be part and parcel of your top priorities in life. And that is very important. It says, for this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, shall join himself unto his wife. He shall, he shall embrace his, his, his wife. And that is very key. Now, God is placing this responsibility on a man because a man is a leader. A man must lead the way. A man must lead by example. You must be on the forefront to embrace and cleave unto your wife. This is very important. Now, there are several enablers of, of cleaving that probably I need to highlight here very quickly. Uh, of course, I already mentioned the aspect of acceptance. You see, you cannot cleave to your spouse if you have not come to accept your spouse. Don't live in the, wonder, in the wonderland of saying, probably, uh, maybe I married wrongly, or what is happening here? You see, the truth of the matter is, if you are now in marriage, there is no thinking about, maybe I did not marry the right person. No, because that decision or that analysis of whether this person is the right person or not should have been done before you entered into marriage. Now that you are into marriage, you must come to accept that, yes, this is the best I could get from the market. <laughs> this is the best I could get from the market. I, I mean, there's no time to waste to say, look, uh, now, because, I mean, some of you have been married for three years, five years, ten years, fifteen years. Why should you be think, still be thinking that probably you married a wrong person? That shouldn't arise in the first place. You must accept that person, that woman, that man as your God-given gift. Well, if there's some few things that are not correct about him or her. Now, that is why we are discussing here, because we'll be looking at how do we correct some of these things. And the principles that I'm giving you are, are aimed at helping you actually to make those corrections in case something is not just right in your marriage or in the life of your spouse. Now, so you need to come to that place of acceptance. Accept your spouse as God-given. Praise the name of Jesus. The other important enabler of cleaving is transparency. You see, be transparent. To be transparent simply means to be open. To be transparent also signifies honesty. You see, there is nothing to hide. Don't hide anything from your spouse. You see, be as transparent and as accountable as possible. Be transparent about your past. Does your spouse know everything about your past, the things you did? Maybe you had a child out of wedlock. Some people up to now, they are still hiding, you know, the, the fact that they, they have a child somewhere. Now, that is not right. You can't cleave to someone that you are hiding certain information from. You see, you need to lay your mind, yourself bare before your spouse. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 25, it says both the man and his wife were naked and then we are not ashamed. That speaks of transparency. Openness and transparency is an important enabler of cleaving. So if you want to cleave to your spouse, you must accept your spouse. You must accept your spouse as God-given. Accept your spouse as a gift from God, and that will help you, you know, create a special place in your heart for your spouse. But also, you need to be transparent. You need to be accountable. Cleaving will also mean that you should be the best of friends. Be the best of friends with your spouse. You see, your spouse should be your closest confidant. That is what I'm saying. You see, I'm encouraging you to be the best of friends. Are you friends in your marriage? Or oh, everything is formal. It's like uh, a, a subordinate and boss, you know. The husband is a boss, the wife is a subordinate and say, so you all you always issue decrees and commands and there is no proper dialogue, there is no genuine fellowship and interaction. That is not right and that is not healthy for your marriage. And so if you want excellence in your marriage, you need to practice 
the principle of cleaving. Be the best of friends. Be open, be transparent, and God is going to help you. The last part of it is the aspect of becoming one flesh. And that is what the Bible is uh, saying here in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24. It says, living will lead to cleaving. And cleaving will lead to becoming one flesh. Becoming one flesh. Of course, the one flesh aspect is, is best pronounced in your sexual intimacy. But beyond that, all I'm saying is be united. Be one. Be one in spirit. Be one in mind. Be one in soul. Be one in purpose. Be one in everything that you do. It's very important. Speak the same language. Be one flesh with your spouse. You do that, you are going to enjoy excellence in your marriage. These are foundational pillars. Before we can talk about any other thing about how to achieve an excellent marriage, how to make your marriage an excellent marriage. I'm telling you that Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24 should be in place in your marriage. You must live, you must cleave, and you must become one flesh. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, in the interest of time, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you in case you have a need. Could be marital, financial, could be a business need, your career, or something is not just adding up in your life and you're saying, Pastor, I just need divine intervention. Or it could be that you are a married person and there is no gift of children, you know, in your marriage. You know, God is a God who is able to supply all our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And he opened the womb of Rachel he opened the womb of Hannah. He opened the womb of Manoah's wife, you know, the parents of Samson. He is well able to open your own womb in case you are in need of the fruit of the womb. And God will do it for you. Praise the name of Jesus. But before we go that far, in case you are not born again, I want to give you this chance to receive Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. It's very important for you that you have a relationship with Jesus. Humble yourself and surrender yourself to the Master. He is well able to serve you and is more than ready to deliver you from every sin and all such kind of wickedness. So let us pray together. If you want to be born again, please follow me in this prayer now. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. Please forgive me and have mercy upon my life. I now receive Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior, and I shall walk with him all the days of my life. Thank you, Father, because all my sins are forgiven. Thank you, Father, because Jesus is Lord of my life, and I shall walk with him all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord of glory, in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Please, if you followed me in that prayer, Congratulations because you are now born again. Your sins are forgiven and your life will never be the same. Now, I want to pray for those of you that are in need of a breakthrough in any aspect of your life. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I give you thanks, praise, glory, and honor because of everyone watching me right now. I release grace, anointing, favor, and glory upon everyone who is in need of a miracle who is in need of a testimony, could be in the area of marriage, finances, health, career, Lord, in every such aspect where that breakthrough, that testimony is needed. I pray, mighty God, let it happen in the name of Jesus. Let there be breakthroughs. Let there be testimonies. Let there be open doors. Let there be success. Let there be prosperity. In the mighty name of Jesus, you are such an amazing God. Thank you, Lord of glory. Thank you for answered prayers. And thank you for the miracles and the testimonies. In Jesus' precious name. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, congratulations for your miracle. Congratulations for that testimony, that breakthrough that God has given you. And please share your testimony with us so we can join you in celebrating God for what is happening in your life. God bless you. In Christ, the hope of glory. In whom there's life and hope for you. Oh.
open your heart, receive from Him. Christ is calling you, brother, receive your hope. Christ is calling you, sister, receive.